today. Having, having already reviewed the dialogue and discussion between Socrates and Gorgias, we move on to the dialogue between Socrates and Polis. And on Friday, we'll discuss the interaction with Callicles and then when Socrates is frustrated and creates a dialogue with himself. So first of all, about Polis. So notice that in this section, we have an interruption of the discussion between, play, uh, between Socrates and Gorgias. So that conversation breaks down and Polis interrupts. And this is an actual guy that we know something about, Polis. He's from Sicily, from Acragus. And he's said to be younger than Socrates, but he's old enough to have composed a treatise on rhetoric that Socrates says he's read. And from other sources, we know that that title may have been something like Word Sanctuaries of the Muses or Shrines of Learned Speech. So very rhetorical <coughs> title for a book on rhetoric. And in another Platonic dialogue about rhetoric, so Plato wrote several dialogues about rhetoric, the Gorgias is one of them. Another one is called the Phaedrus. And Socrates there describes Polis. So we think that he's an actual person. He was a professional teacher of rhetoric. And he was a student of Gorgias, and probably other people as well. Now, the Greek word polis literally means cult. And Socrates, as well as others who mention him in antiquity, make fun of his name as if he's somebody that has cultish impatience. Um, he's also represented as having inferior skills and manners than his teacher, so he interrupts Gorgias, and he falls back on such weak and fallacious arguments as appeal to popular opinion and appeal to fear. Now, whether or not the actual polis was that much of an asshole or not we, is not a question we can answer because we don't have any of his works and we don't have any descriptions of him except by his hostile critics like Plato. But the way he's depicted in Plato as somebody that's concerned with appearances and concerned how he appears to other people and concerned with conventional concepts of morality. So he intervenes exactly at a point where Socrates has shown up an inconsistency or a contradiction in Gorgias's argument. And at the end of class last time, we discussed what that contradiction is. And it comes down to the fact that Gorgias claims both that if a student uses the rhetorical skill that Gorgias teaches unjustly, then the student, as opposed to the teacher, is unjust and is to blame. But on the other hand, if a student doesn't know anything about justice, then Gorgias will teach it to him. And so the student will be just. And so this creates a contradiction because Gorgias's students will both be just and unjust, and that's incoherent. But according to Polis, Gorgias wasn't really being serious or sincere when he said, if a student doesn't know about justice, then I would make sure he does before giving him these powerful weapons of rhetoric. Instead, Polis says, it was only out of shame or embarrassment that Gorgias said that if a student doesn't know about justice, then Gorgias would teach it to him. Like if you ask me, do you make sure that those students you're teaching know something about justice before you give them those powerful tools of writing and speaking? I would say, sure, I make sure that they know justice, because I wouldn't want to admit that I was teaching potentially unjust people. Now, at 461b and following, we can tell that Polis, at least as he's being depicted by Plato, is very concerned about shame and appearances and becoming embarrassed and so forth. And he believes that Gorgias said he would only teach justice because he was ashamed not to say that, not because he actually would do. So Gorgias, in Polis's view, isn't guilty of a contradiction. In fact, he would teach just or unjust people how to use rhetoric. He just doesn't want to admit that. So Polis says, who do you think would deny that he himself knows what's just and would teach it to others? Everyone 
would say that at least. Nobody would admit, oh, I, don't, I guess I don't know the difference between right and wrong. Or I guess I don't care if the students that I teach are just or unjust. So Polis is concerned with conforming to popular expectation and avoiding the shame and embarrassment of not doing so. Now the issue arises whether rhetoric is really an art or craft or skill in Greek a techni, or whether it's just a knack or kind of routine in empeiria in Greek. And Polis is apparently on the verge of giving a long rhetorical speech of the kind he's learned how to give from Gorgias, and a speech that would apparently resolve the contradictions that come out in Gorgias' speech and explain how glorious and powerful rhetoric is without getting into these contradictions that Socrates led Gorgias into. But Socrates says, I'm not going to listen to your long-winded speech about it. Rather, let's do it this way. I'll ask you some questions and examine whether you know what you're talking about, and you give me the answers to those questions, and we'll see if they can be refuted. And this is Socrates' preferred method. Socrates prefers examining students by midterm and final exams rather than using long writing assignments, because with long writing assignments, students can go on and bullshit things and not cite their sources and, and you know, appear kind of linguistically competent, and then we have to give them partial credit and so forth. But when we give exams, we really find out who did the reading and who knows what they're talking about. So Socrates wants to give this kind of immediate examination of the student, and that is, his, that is the Socratic method of elenchus, meaning examining and refuting somebody's ideas. Now, earlier in the dialogue, Polis already said two things that are pertinent to the examination that he's made to undergo. The first was an assertion that empeiria, meaning experience, familiarity, routine, or knack, breeds art, techne, while inexperience <laughs> merely breeds chance, lucky or unlucky outcomes. But Socrates argues that he doesn't think rhetoric is an art or a skill or a craft. He thinks it's merely a routine or familiarity or knack, and specifically one that produces gratification and pleasure. And Pola says, oh, well, isn't that a good thing? Isn't having a knack or a routine for producing gratification and pleasure, isn't that an admirable thing? Aren't you then agreeing that rhetoric is a great thing since it gives us a routine or a, or a method, a kind of experience in how to produce gratification and pleasure? Now, Polis's claim that rhetoric is an admirable thing recalls the second thing that Gorgias had said earlier in the dialogue in response to the question, what is your art? That is, what is this thing called rhetoric? Polis had said, Gorgias had said, and now Polis repeats that, oh, my art is the most admirable of all the arts. So being admirable is a crucial part of their conception of what they're doing. Now, as Socrates pointed out, that's inadequate as an answer to the question, what is this art? Because it merely gives a quality or specifies the value of the art while not giving any definition of what it actually does. But Socrates has a conception of what this is, and he says, it's not actually an art. It's not an art at all. Rhetoric is just a kind of knack or routine. So, Let's distinguish between three sets of questions. A question that says, what is an art? What is a techne? And is rhetoric one of them? A second set of questions that says, specifically, what is the art of rhetoric? And what does it do or what can it achieve? And a third set of questions that asks, how are we to evaluate the art of rhetoric? And is it an admirable thing or a shameful thing? Now, Polis, in response to the question, what is rhetoric? gives an answer to the third question, at which point Socrates says, before we can answer the third question, we have to answer the second question. What is this art of rhetoric? What can it actually achieve? So when Polis goes on to answer that question, then Socrates responds that 
actually, we can't answer that until we answer the first question. So we can't know what the art of rhetoric is or what it can do and achieve unless we know whether it's an art and what an art actually is. So Socrates is showing up how these masters of rhetoric and these masters of answering questions can't even keep straight the order of priority of questions that need to be answered. Now, it's very insulting, I think, to say that rhetoric is a knack or a routine, at least if you're someone who thinks that it's an art or a craft or a skill, or even worse, if you're somebody who thinks it's a kind of science or a kind of knowledge or something like that. To consider it or call it just a knack and not an art or a craft is to say that it isn't really a skilled thing. It's just a matter of routine. Like, I could give you a s set of step-by-step -step instructions or a checklist that you could carry out, and then you would be able to execute that task. A routine, exactly as in a computer program or in a comedy routine or anything, is just a set of repeatable actions that are performed in response to a given situation. And it is attained by experience or familiarity with analogous or similar situations and actions. And so a trained rhetorician at this point in time, and this is the way that we think the training worked, is that you would have prepared or set speeches designed for different kinds of occasions. Oh, if you're praising somebody, you want a speech that essentially has these features. If you want to blame someone, something that has these features. If you want to argue that they're guilty, say this. If you want to argue they're innocent, say say that. If you want to encourage someone to do these actions, do, say these kind of things. If you want to discourage them from doing actions, say these other kinds of things. And you actually give them sort of model speeches of each one of those. And then you say, and when you, when you find out who your actual audience is, then adapt it to those. You know, fill in the kind of ad lib things so that you, you know, replace these generic names with specific names of your actual client or the person you actually want to praise, but basically it's a set out thing that we can just, we can just hand over to you. Now, Socrates criticizes rhetoric by characterizing it as that kind of thing, a kind of thing where you just learn how to do these things by mechanical rote and it doesn't require much intelligence or creativity. But he also further criticizes it by saying that it's specifically a routine or a knack for producing gratification and pleasure, right? So he characterizes it as, as essentially being a knack for selecting a good speech and memorizing it that's already been designed to give to a given audience. Again, sort of like a comedy routine. If the comedian's really good, then it looks like it's very original, but that's because they've done it thousands and thousands of times, and so they're capable of making it look like it's really fresh and original, but they've done it again and again, and so they have a knack for entertaining people and giving them pleasure. Now, this um, definition gets replaced by an even more obscure one, so Socrates begins to refer and offer a positive account of what rhetoric is by making a distinction. He says it's actually a knack not just for producing gratification and pleasure, but for producing flattery. And he says there's a lot of different arts that produce flattery, that make us feel good, or give, this, give the appearance of something good when it's not actually good. So he uses this term that we translate something like catering, although it can also be translated dessert making or baking or candy making or confectionery or something, which is a skill that allows one to produce the appearance of good food, like food that really tastes good, without it actually being nutritious. Or it's something you really want to eat. It has a lot of different flavors, or it's very attractive uh, to eat but it's not actually very good for you. There's an art form of doing this. I mean, most of the people that produce junk food or advertisements for fast food do this, make it look like, oh, this is what you want to eat, and make it look like it's good food without it actually being so. And he says rhetoric is kind of like that. It creates the appearance of good speeches about topics like the just and unjust without delivering the actual reality of it. Another um, example of this 
is cosmetics, which he says doesn't actually make people beautiful. It just gives them the appearance of beauty without the reality of it. And he also throws in sophistry, which is the appearance of making good speeches about things like law and order, or even just about natural science and other things. Remember, sophistry was one of the terms and the charges that came in to describe the kind of activities going on in the thinkery in Aristophanes, that you have these people appearing like they're wise men, but actually they're very foolish and, and um, ridiculous people. So if there's a general class of things that tend to flatter us or give us the appearance of things without giving us the reality of them, and if rhetoric is one of them, then that tells us what kind of thing or what class of thing rhetoric belongs to, but it doesn't yet tell us what makes it a distinctive thing of that kind. So Socrates further specifies that rhetoric is a, quote, image of a part of politics. That's at 463D. And that's a very obscure expression and one that we have to unpack. And the interlocutors are made to respond by saying, what the hell do you mean by calling rhetoric an image of, the, of a part of politics? It's, it's an obscure thing to say. So in order to explain this, we have to develop an elaborate analogy between different kinds of skills. So consider various kinds of skills for caring for the body. So I'm just going to talk about this column here. So gymnastics and medicine are two different kinds of skills that cater to caring for the body. And gymnastics is a kind of care for the body that preserves and enhances the body, makes it, makes it fit by taking the health that it already has and making it even stronger and better. Whereas medicine is a corrective or restorative care of the body. In case there's disease or illness, then medicine is a, is a kind of art, skill, or craft, a techne that comes in in order to restore or correct what's wrong in the body. And Socrates compares that to an analogous set of things that care for the soul, not the body. What cares for the soul by preserving and enhancing it is legislation. So we pass laws in order to take the citizen body, the, the, the body politic, as it were, and make it good, make it uh, better, preserve its good parts, enhance the parts of it that are good. And in case there's parts of the body politic or rather of the soul of certain people that's actually bad or deficient in some way, then we use justice, the justice system, in order to correct or restore the health of the soul. And so this is actually meant to be a division of politics. That poli There's two dimensions to politics. One is legislation. That's the preservative and enhancing part that takes the souls of the citizens and, and keeps what's good in them and makes it even better. And justice is the part that restores or corrects the deficiencies. And so justice is therefore analogous to medicine, which does, it deals with the, the illnesses or deficiencies of the body. And legislation is analogous to gymnastics, gymnastics since it preserves and enhances the body. OK, so keep in mind that analogy, and now we expand the analogy considerably. So again, starting with this first column, to repeat myself, care of the body, we have two kinds of arts, skills, or crafts associated with this, gymnastics, which preserves or enhances the body, and medicine, which corrects or restores it in case of deficiencies or illnesses. And Socrates says, there's two kinds of flattery knacks that correspond to those. So corresponding to gymnastics is something that creates an image of preserving or enhancing the body. And that's cosmetics or plastic surgery or something that doesn't actually 
make anybody more beautiful. You know, like plastic surgery just makes people look like they have plastic surgery. But you know, cosmetics just just make give the appearance that somebody's beautiful without the reality of it. And this catering or pastry making or baking or whatever isn't like medicine, which actually regulates diets and so forth so as to improve health, but it makes it seem like it's giving wholesome, good food by making it taste good, by making it appealing in other ways. But cosmetics is to gymnastics as catering is to medicine. That is, these are, these are images or fake versions of those, so-called arts that imitate actual arts like gymnastics and medicine. Now, if we move over to this column, and so we're talking about the soul and politics, we also have our legitimate skill and art of legislation, which again aims at preserving and enhancing the body politic, and justice, which aims at correcting or restoring in case there is some injustice or deficiency there. But corresponding to those, there are also these fake knacks, these imitative things that merely give us an image of that. And the name of the thing that imitates legislation, the fake version of it, is called sophistry. And now we arrive at our definition of rhetoric. Rhetoric is that knack or uh, routine which gives an image of being a corrective or restorative art corresponding to justice without actually being it. And that is how rhetoric is an image of a part of politics. Part of politics because politics divides into legislation and justice and an image of a part of it because it's an image or a fake replica of that part of politics that deals with justice. So rhetoric is therefore, the, the scope of it is restricted here to talking about justice and uh, the kind of things that happens in courts. And rhetoric, you know, training lawyers to be able to get clients off or um, prosecute them with indifference to what the actual truth is, that kind of skill is ca called an image of a part of politics for that reason. Any, any questions about that? that elaborate set of analogies and how he arrives at that definition? OK, good. Now, Polis says, well, you're calling it a kind of flattery. Um, that you seem to hold it in low regard, Socrates. Um, but I don't think that rhetoric should be held in low regard because rhetoricians have the greatest power in cities. So they should be held in high regard. Rhetor high powered attorneys, really powerful people in society. Right? So Socrates responds by denying that rhetoricians actually have great power in cities if by power we mean something that's good for the one who has the power. Now, notice that Polis accepts Socrates' linkage of power and self-interest. He points out that rhetoricians, just like tyrants, can have people put to death, confiscate property, banish or exile people from the city. Don't these examples show that they have great power in cities? You know, if a high-powered attorney comes after you, he can... He can prosecute you with a death penalty and get you put to death or make it so that all of your property is seized or that you're exiled and banished from the city. Seems like great power, right? Socrates responds by attempting to prove that rhetoricians and tyrants may do what seems fit to them by banishing and confiscating and exiling and so forth, but they still don't have power to do what they want to do. And if he can show that, then they, he would show that they, in fact, do not have great power. So how does he show that? Well, I'll break the argument down for you into basically six parts. First part is we make a distinction between three different classes of things. First of all, good things, things that we could all agree are good. 
things like wisdom, beauty, wealth, and health. They're always good. They always produce good consequences for the person who has them. And we can distinguish those from bad things. This is a pretty elementary lesson in ethics. But ignorance, poverty, sickness, those are always bad and always produce bad consequences for the person that has them. And we can distinguish these good things and bad things from neutral things, or what we might call instrumental things, things like walking, running, sailing, sticks, stones, and so forth. Sometimes those are good, sometimes they're bad. Sometimes it's good to walk, sometimes it's bad to walk. Sometimes you should sail, sometimes you shouldn't. Sometimes you use sticks in order to save someone who's drowning in a pool. Sometimes you use it to bash an innocent person over the head. So it could be good, could be bad. So things in this class are utilized either for good or bad, but are not in themselves good or bad. They are neutral or instrumental. Okay, the second part of the argument, we observe that neutral things are always chosen for the sake of good things and not for bad things. We always want to bring about good things. That means things that are in our own interest. So we choose things in the neutral category because we want to achieve good things or avoid bad things. We don't choose them for the sake of doing neutral things themselves. So people take medicine in order to get healthy, not just so that they can take medicine. And people work in order that they can make a living, not just because they love working. Or people show up to lectures in order that they can pass the class or get a degree, not just because they love showing up at lectures. So neutral things like showing up at lectures, taking pills, working, all fit into this neutral category and aren't themselves good or bad. Now, the next three steps I can go through pretty quickly. Activities like banishing people from the city, confiscating their property, or putting them to death are neutral things. Hence, they're done for the sake of some good thing. Those who do these things want to do them because they achieve something good. Again, good for themselves. So nobody banishes just for the sake of banishing or confiscates property just for confiscating property. You confiscate property because you think it'll be good because I'll have more property then, and wealth is a good thing. Or if I banish this person, then they won't challenge my power, and my having power is a good thing. Or I put them to death because they're a menace to society, and I want to avoid that, that um, evil being a problem. Now, if a tyrant or an orator confiscates someone or puts them to death or banishes them because he thinks that a good thing will result from that, but in fact a bad thing results from it, then we'll say he does what he sees fit, but not what he actually wants to do. This is, again, because everybody that employs neutral or instrumental things wants them for the sake of good things, not bad things, but sometimes they end up actually producing bad things. And if they do, he's done what he sees fit, but not what he actually wants to do. Also, throw in this premise and emphasize it, that by having power, I necessarily mean something good for the one who has power. So holding this argument to the strict requirement that it show that these good things are good for the agents themselves. I'm not talking about some generic abstract sense of good in the overall universe or good according to how philosophers talk about it. I mean very simply good in the agent's own interest. The final step is that if the rhetorician or tyrant achieves a bad thing by banishing or confiscating or putting someone to death, then he's done something bad for himself. And he's not done what he wanted to do, but has done what he saw fit to do. Therefore, it's possible for rhetoricians and tyrants to do things that they see fit and yet not have real power, which requires doing what they want to do. So consequently, Polis's claim that rhetoricians like tyrants wield great power in cities by virtue of the fact that they can do whatever they want is refuted by Socrates. That doesn't mean they can do whatever they want. It just means they can do what they see fit. But you haven't shown that 
them being able to do what they see fit is what they want to do or is in their own interest. That would take a further argument. Yeah. Uh, by like what they want to do, do you mean like in the main goal of being something good? I, I mean doing something that benefits them, yes. that's in their own interest. That's all I mean by doing good. Okay. It would this would be a much weaker argument if all I had to show is that is talking about good in an abstract sense. But th this is these these people banishing, exiling, and so forth. Socrates means to say are doing things that's not in their own self-interest. Not just that it's bad because we condemn things like like um, banishing innocent people or confiscating their property. There might be a sense in which that's just bad, that we could argue that doing that is bad morally, even if it's to the benefit of the person, like they get rich from doing it or something like this. But Socrates' argument is that it's bad for that person themselves. Or at least that Polis hasn't shown that it's good for that person themselves. All, he's, all he has been able to do is show that they're able to do these things. There's, but there's, there's an assumption that being able to do things is good. But it's like these examples we keep coming up to that, you know, mere power is not in itself good. Nuclear power might be good if it allows us to solve the energy crisis or to have a form of energy that doesn't emit as much carbon and so can deal with climate, but it could be bad if it gets in the hands of people who use it as a weapon, like the U.S. did, and so forth. So, Merely saying they have the ability to do a bunch of neutral activities does not show what the argument is intended to show. And that, that's Socrates' point. Now, how does Polis respond? He says that Socrates' position that it's possible for one who has power in the city to do as he sees fit, but not to do what he wants, he replies to that by saying that well, Socrates, you would envy somebody that had the ability to execute or banish people or seize their property. Wouldn't you envy somebody that had that power in the city? And Socrates says, well, do you mean that, they, that I would have the power to do those things justly or unjustly? And Polo says, doesn't matter. Wouldn't you be envied either way? In fact, it seems even more enviable to Polis if you can do it with indifference to justice or injustice. That just shows you have more power. If you only have power to do it justly, that would be kind of a restriction on your power. What's the point of being a tyrant is that you don't have to worry about stuff like that. You get to do it no matter what. And Socrates says, no, whoever puts another to death unjustly is miserable and not powerful and is to be pitied and not envied. So how does he show that? Well, first of all, compare a ranking of four different things. Here's Polis's ranking. It'd be really bad to be put to death justly. Like, you did something wrong, you murdered some innocent people, and so a court found you were guilty and they executed you. Really bad thing to happen. One of the worst things that can happen to you, right? Maybe the worst thing. Almost as bad is being put to death unjustly. Presumably being put to death unjustly is better because at least you weren't unjust and didn't actually murder those people. It's still bad because you're dead, but at least, at least you, you can hold on to the fact that you didn't do anything wrong. Um, better than either of those because you live is putting other people to death ju justly. I mean... Pretty much we can all agree that's a good thing if it's just. Now, I don't happen to think that the death penalty is ever just, but that's, we don't need to think about that issue. We could replace putting to death with any form of punishment, and the argument would work out. So suppose that there are some people that it's just to put to death. They're so monstrous. They've, they've done such horrendous crimes that death is actually justified. Then putting them to death unjustly would be, in a, would be a good thing to do. And Polis thinks that the best thing is if you could put people to death unjustly. If you had so much power that you could, you could put people to death whether they deserved it or not, because you're a, you're a super strong tyrant. Okay, and Socrates flips this ranking, and he says that actually putting people to death unjustly is the worst thing you can do. It is worse even than being put to death justly or being put to death 
unjustly. So the rankings actually agree except for the elements that I put in green and red. They agree on which things are better and worse except for they flip whether it's a great power to put somebody to death unjustly or whether that's actually the worst thing you can do. Now, Pola says, oh, OK, so you wouldn't want to be a tyrant then, right? And Socrates replies by giving him a thought experiment. The thought experiment, as he puts it, is the crowded marketplace. We could replace it with a school shooter example, right? You all have the power. You could have just brought a gun in here and shot us all, right? You could have murdered us uh, all and so put us all to death. Every one of you has the power to do that. There's almost nothing we could do to reply to it, as so many instances show. Isn't that a great power? You can put to death whoever you want. And Polis says, well, that, that, that would be good. That would be nice. But the problem is that, and, and the, their example is somebody brings a knife into a crowded marketplace. Yes, you could start attacking random people with a knife and put them to death. But it's not such a great thing because you're likely to get caught, caught or killed. And so therefore, it's not actually in your self-interest. That's not a great uh, power, right? Again, the action itself is neutral. Stabbing people with knives, shooting them with guns. That could be good or could be bad, but the power to do it itself is not a great or a good power until we find out if its consequences are good or bad. So since it's only when the outcome is good that the person who acts can be said to have real power, someone only has real power if they act justly, not unjustly. So no, you don't have a great power, the fact that you could have brought a gun in here and killed us all. That's not, that isn't a great power. It doesn't benefit you. It's not a good thing. It's not a power. And people that do that are weak and miserable, unjust, horrible human beings. But Polis actually rejects this and claims that ancient history has got a ample examples of people who acted unjustly and, and are a lot happier because they did so. And his example is Archelaus, although you could replace it with practically any other politicians in history. Um, but the example is meant to show that a person who would have been a slave because of treachery and murder of innocent people usurps the throne and becomes a tyrant and is able to torture and put other people to death and enslave them and so forth. And Polis says, isn't he better because he was unjust so that he became able to do that? And Polis says, everyone would agree that he's happier than if he had not been unjust. Almost everyone. Everyone or almost everyone would agree. And that leads to a digression which gets into the fallacy of appealing to what everyone or most people would say, which cuts no ice whatsoever in a moral argument like this, although I won't bother going through the reasons for that. So returning to the main line of argument, the next stage that's crucial is to point out how Polis thinks it's possible to be unjust and happy as long as one doesn't get punished. And Socrates denies this, holding that, quote, this is 472e, a man who is unjust is thoroughly miserable, the more so if he doesn't get his due punishment for the wrongdoing he commits, the less so if he pays and receives what is due at the hands of both gods and men. Now, Polis supports his side by saying, but punishment's really painful, and, and he describes getting tortured and banished and punished and having your property confiscated, and he commits another fallacy of reasoning that we call appeal to fear. You must think this is a bad thing because it's painful. So you must think punishment's bad because it's painful and nobody wants to undergo pain. But Socrates offers a different rank ordering that challenges Polis's assumptions. So Polis thinks that it's more miserable to be an unjust person who is punished than to be an unjust person who isn't punished. But Socrates argues it's exactly opposite. It is more, more miserable to be an unjust person who's not punished than to be an unjust person who is punished. Now, the key to the entire rest of the 
episode with Polis is the following concession that he makes. He thinks that suffering injustice is worse than doing injustice, but he concedes that doing injustice is more shameful than suffering it. And remember, this is a manifestation of his character. He is the kind of person who is concerned about shame and embarrassment and conventional morality. So while he thinks that the person who is unjust and is punished is more miserable, he'll agree that that's less shameful. And while he thinks that an unjust person who isn't punished is less miserable, because they didn't have the pain of being punished, he agrees that it's more shameful. And that, of course, fits with our intuitions. Even if you're the kind of person who thinks that it'd be great to be a murderer or a robber if you could get away with it, still it seems that you would agree it's more shameful to be a murderer or a robber than to be murdered or to be robbed. And furthermore, you think it's more shameful to be a robber who's not punished than it is to be a robber who is punished. That's much less shameful. So the shame and the good state come apart in, his, in, in Polis's account. And this allows Socrates to make a set of proofs of those paradoxes that I pointed out to you last time. So he's able to show why committing injustice is actually worse than suffering injustice. So he defines the admirable, that predicate that Polis is so concerned with. Socrates says that the admirable means that it either produces more pleasure or more benefit, and the shameful produces more pain or more harm. So if something is more shameful, it's either more painful or more harmful or both. But if committing injustice is more shameful, then committing injustice is either more painful, more harmful, or both. Now, committing, committing injustice is not painful, that's what we've just been through and why the appeal to fear doesn't work on that side of the argument. But since committing injustice is not painful, by a process of elimination, it must be that it's either more, that it's more harmful than suffering injustice. Thus, it is less bad and less harmful to suffer injustice than to commit injustice. And again, being punished is better or more good than not being punished by a similar argument. Just punishment involves paying what is due. If you're justly punished, then you pay what's due. And there's a theory presented that you're acted upon by being punished. And if something acts upon another thing, then the thing that's acted upon assumes the quality of the thing acting upon it. So if you've been punished justly, then you justly pay what's due. And so you do a just and admirable thing, and so you are just. The person who is punished and does his time or subjects himself to that punishment is, for that very reason, a just person. Now, Polis conceded that justice is more admirable than injustice, but if it's more admirable, then it's either more pleasant or more beneficial or both. Now, clearly, being punished is not more pleasurable than not being punished. So by a process of elimination, it must be that being punished is more beneficial. Thus, whoever is punished is benefited by being punished, and it is better to be punished than not to be punished, assuming you've done something wrong. And finally, we can use this argument to show why injustice is actually the worst thing of all by introducing a couple more principles here. So Socrates tries to make his claim that being punished is better than not being punished more plausible by developing a theory of punishment that we call rehabilitative theory or rehabilitation. And a rehabilitative theory of punishment basically says that a person is improved by being punished. The point of punishing them is to make them actually better. One who pays what's due gets rid of something bad in his soul and of bad things, those in the soul are the worst. And I can prove that easily by distinguishing between three kinds of bad things. Bad things with re respect to external things like wealth, uh, the bad thing would be poverty. With respect to the body, it would be something like illness or disease. 
with respect to the soul, its corruption or justice. Now, which of these is most shameful? Being poor is not more shameful than being corrupt or unjust. And being sick or having a disease is not more shameful than being corrupt or unjust. Thus, injustice and corruption of the soul is the most shameful. And it follows from that, since it's most shameful, that it's either most harmful, most painful, or both. Now, injustice is not more painful than poverty or sickness, of course. So by a process of elimination, injustice must be more harmful. Being the most harmful, injustice then is the worst thing that there is, Socrates argues. Now, here's why committing injustice and not being punished is the worst thing of all. Various kinds of bad things, Socrates says, are remedied by certain crafts. So you go to a banker or a financier to remedy the badness of poverty, and you go to a doctor or a medical practitioner in order to remedy the bad things of the body, like disease or illness. That's why we go to bankers and doctors. Who do we go to in order to solve corruption and disease? We go to judges. Socrates asks Polis directly, which of these crafts do you think is more admirable, banking, medicine, or law? And of course he says law, because he's a law student who's just finished law school and learning how to argue in law courts. So he says that must be the most admirable one. It follows that it must be the most pleasurable or the most beneficial or both. Now consider the case of people going to doctors in order to cure a disease. Often the treatment is painful, but the long-term result is less pain and other benefits like longevity or vitality, or going to the dentist. Sometimes it's painful, but it's a lot less painful than having all of your teeth rot out. So it is with going to judges. Sometimes the treatment or the punishment is painful, but they're being treated by the most admirable agents in the most admirable way with respect to the most important things. A person who doesn't undergo such treatment, on the other hand, keeps the shameful thing and the horrible evils with respect to the most important thing, his soul, and in the most disgraceful way. So the person who tries to escape punishment because they're focused on the pain of it and not the benefit is like a patient who focuses on the pain of dental surgery or of injections instead of the benefit of the surgery or the drugs. And thus, since these tyrants like Archelaus are most unjust and they have such power that they're able to avoid all punishment, they're in the worst possible state. So they're the most miserable and the most harmful human beings of all. So the conclusion that Socrates draws from this, it's really incredible, but he draws the conclusion that rhetoric is completely useless unless you're a bad person. So he applies these foregoing arguments to the value of rhetoric. He says, in courts, rhetoric can help you get off if you've committed an injustice. That's the source of the tyrannical power that Polis considers so impressive. But this result only helps you in being harmed and becoming more miserable. Helping you avoid punishment makes you worse if you've really done something wrong. The only good use of rhetoric, Socrates says, would be if you used it to accuse and convict yourself if you did anything unjust. Or if one of your friends or family did something wrong, then you could use rhetoric in order to convince judges and juries that they ought to punish you or your friends or your family to make sure that they get that healthy and wholesome punishment that improves our souls. On the other hand, if you have an enemy in court, someone that you hate, and they're about to be found guilty and punished, then rhetoric would be useful to help them get off and escape punishment. And this way you could make your enemies miserable and shameful people and hurt them by unjustly getting them off in court and using your rhetorical abilities to, to make it so that they aren't found guilty. That would be a kind of usefulness of rhetoric. So, Rhetoric is useful just in case either you committed some injustice and so you need to ensure that you yourself get punished or your friends or family, 
or it would be useful if your enemy committed injustice, but you want to help him avoid punishment so that he doesn't become a better person. The conclusion then is that for the person who doesn't have any intention of committing injustice, rhetoric doesn't have any use whatsoever. 